It's a pleasure to, to welcome you here uh, for this first uh, um, seminar of this series that we hope uh, uh, will take off and, and, um, and become a tradition. So the idea uh, was actually not from me. It was uh, Bob Penner who, who contacted me now quite a number of years ago to uh, discuss together the possibility to start uh, a, a tradition of, a, of conference between that would bring together people who have not the habit to talk to each other, namely people coming from cognitive science, from mathematics, from biology, and artificial intelligence. And so uh, uh, this is what we are trying to do, uh, uh, to start to, to see how uh, uh, mathematics can contribute to and, and intelligence artificial that can contribute to, to science in biology and how science in biology can contribute to science in, uh, uh, in, artificial, in, in, in artificial intelligence, in cognitive science, etc. So how these different sciences can potentially start to uh, uh, realize the language they have in common and uh, uh, cross fertilize. And uh, uh, um, so it took us quite a few years to get started, but here is the first event. This is uh, an experience, it is a trial, we'll see how much it, we succeed. And I am extremely thankful to our three speakers this year who accepted to take up on the, the challenge and to uh, uh, give us quite a bit of their time to come here, to spend a week together here and to give us uh, uh, insight in, into the science. The topic we choose uh, uh, for this year is, we thought it was the best way to start a project that is about uh, uh, communication between sciences, to start with uh, communication in general and communication in biology. And so uh, uh, the three speakers uh, 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 this year will be Mark Mesher, uh, and we'll start right now, uh, Consuelo de Moraes and uh, Simon Townsend. What brings them together is that they are trying to understand and better understand from a, a theoretical point of view as much as from an experimental point of view and how uh, uh, organisms communicate. It's about communication inside the species, but also across species. And that's what we will uh, uh, learn about. The first talk by Mark will be a, uh, uh, from a, a very uh, evolutionary perspective and, and, and theoretical conceptual perspective. Uh, he will uh, really introduce the topic. And then Consuelo uh, uh, will tell us more today about communication between uh, uh, plant and insects. <laughs> and then tomorrow, Simon will try to uh, uh, investigate whether species have languages in the sense we understand languages that means uh, uh, vocal languages that involve a grammar uh, uh, and a number of uh, uh, characteristics that we know for human languages and, and uh, linguistics. So, but without any further ado, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank and welcome Mark for the first lecture coming from ETH Zurich. Uh, uh, welcome here and thank you for taking up the challenge and accepting to come. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's great to be able to have the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, the, the somewhat ambitious title of my talk is A Natural History of Information. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a very broad sort of philosophical overview, and I can tell you that for certain that, that some parts of the talk are going to be very simplistic um, for, for, for some of you. Um, however, I'm hoping, given the, the purpose of this meeting and this idea of integrating people from different fields, that, there, that there's some value in this sort of broad sort of inter integrative overview that I'm going to, to, to attempt here. Um, so I want to start with that said, um, with this observation that information is, of course, uh, intimately familiar to all of us. We're constantly working with information on our phones or computers, reading scientific papers, attending meetings like this. Um, and yet, for me, at least, there's this also this very strange quality about information. Uh, because, for example, we also have the feeling that our senses provide us information about the world, that the DNA in our cells is an informational storage process as well, that even our very minds somehow are informational. Um, and the connections between those different processes are not always entirely obvious. 
um, but they're also not just an analogy. So for example, in the lab, I can take a tissue culture from some organism, send it to a sequencing facility, get back a representation of that DNA sequence on representative pixels on my computer screen that's then transmitted via light to my eyes by nerve signals into my brain somehow that we don't quite understand into my conscious awareness. I could email that same sequence to a colleague in Japan and along the way it's pulses of light and some fiber optic cable under the ocean. But my colleague could then synthesize that DNA sequence back into DNA, put it back into an organism, uh, and it resumes its biological functions. Um, so there's almost this mystical quality about information. Um, and to a certain extent, that's, that's just substrate neutrality. We can encode the same, in, the same information in many different media. Um, in my example, there's also clearly something going on in terms of translation between different coding systems. So we can construct electronic information about genetic information, but then we can translate that electronic information back into the genetic code itself. Um, so with that prelude, I want to talk a little bit about this question of sort of what is, in, in sort of a philosophical sense, what is information? Um, and for, for many in this room, intimately familiar, if we, you know, as close as we come to sort of a formal scientific theory of information is, is information, mathematical information theory. Shannon started with Shannon's theory. Um, and that's obviously very powerful in its own do domain. And I think it's a very valuable tool also for thinking more generally and broadly philosophically about information. Um, but as I say in the slide here, Shannon sort of starts a little bit in the middle, um, assuming, for example, generally the, the pre existence of a sender and a receiver that are generally. Uh, intentional agents, human beings, or, or artifacts that humans have created, uh, attempting to, to communicate through some communication channel. And with that assumption, then we can talk about uh, the nature of the code that they're using, the information capacity of that channel, its resilience to sources of noise, error correction, and so on and so forth. Um, so one point is that, that this theory is basically a syntactic theory. It's largely agnostic to the meaning of these bits of information that are flowing through the channel. Um, and then again, as an evolutionist, I'm sort of don't want to don't want to assume the existence of the sender and receiver in the channel. I want to sort of know where those things come from. Um, so if you want to generalize then from human communication systems and human information systems um, to think about information broadly in a general biological sense, um, the obvious move, uh, and it will be my move as well, is to talk about adaptation. So no, the, the flower doesn't intend to communicate with the bee, uh, but it's been shaped by natural selection in ways that it presents these communicative signals that have this effect. Um, and if you were to look at a pay philosophical paper that's sort of written from that perspective, like this one by Jablanca, you find an adaptationist definition of information and you find a lot of technical fine print about exactly what counts as information, how we recognize it and so forth. Uh, and more or less in broad strokes, I'm completely happy with that sort of approach. Um, but for the purposes of this talk today, I kind of want to draw uh, a more basic sort of connection between these ideas of adaptation and selection and information uh, in a way that's certainly less rigorous than this, but maybe a little bit more uh, intuitive. Uh, and for that, I want to start with just some basic sort of dictionary definitions of some of these words. So if we go to the uh, OED and look at the information, uh, the definition of information, I think the most relevant part for us is the part I've highlighted here. What is conveyed or represented by a particular array, arrangement or sequence of things? Um, now, represented by maybe already assumes too much, right? We're already starting a little bit in the middle. Um, and conveyed is fine, but then the question is, what exactly is it that's being conveyed? Um, and I think there it's maybe useful to talk about what's not being conveyed in informational interactions, namely matter and energy or at least we can say that those interactions are not primarily about the transfer of matter and energy. Um, so for example, um, when you look at this talk and you have um, the light coming off the screen and hitting your retina, uh, there's a little bit of energy that's transmitted there. Uh, but the most interesting that's happening then is that that image on your retina is, uh, is elicits a, a cascade of electrochemical signaling in your brain that results in you basically comprehending the words that are on the screen. Um, and I don't want to, so that, again, that's, that, there's this kind of strange feature of information that we can have interactions between two species that are sort of very subtle on a physical level, and yet they have these big implications for, for, for the behavior of those systems. Uh, and again, in general terms, I don't want to talk about necessarily about meaning and interpretation or representations yet, um, but I'm pretty happy to talk about informational systems being 
those in which the second system is in some sense reading the first system. Uh, and in, indeed, I want to argue that basically information needs to be defined always uh, with reference to some specific reader of information uh, and looking forward a bit also that those readers are basically always going to be products of some Darwinian process of natural selection. Um, if I turn to the definition of selection, not natural selection yet, but just selection in general, it just says the action of selecting or choosing out. But maybe already we start to see uh, a glimpse of a possible connection here because informational systems are those where it matters the particular configuration of a system that then informs some other system and selective processes broadly are the ones that can be choosing one, one sequence or one configuration versus another. Uh, and if I highlight the more technical part of the first definition there that talks about the probability of occurrence of a particular sequence against that of alternative sequences, um, then it, it highlights that sort of connection maybe even better. Um, <clears throat> this, of course, is sort of pointing directly back at sort of formal information theory, um, but maybe it also hints at a way in which in biological systems we can, we can get the evolution of semantic uh, information uh, where processes like natural selection are constraining these, these systems into particular sequences that actually have some meaning in a particular biological context. Um, and with that prelude, um, or moving on then from, from those basic definitions, so, so the, the area of the field of science that sort of deals directly with this issue of the configuration of physical systems is thermodynamics. Uh, and I want to touch just briefly on this concept of entropy uh, that is also a very interesting connection point between sort of evolutionary theory uh, and information theory. Um, and to see why it's useful to consider a uh, toy model. And the one that I like to talk about uh, is Rubik's Cube, because it's a simple physical system that has a finite but enormous number of discrete sort of positions. So it turns out that a Rubik's Cube has about 4.3 times 10 to the 19th discrete positions. Uh, and it was fairly recently shown uh, that all of those positions are within 20 moves of, of the solution. Um, for me, the more interesting point is how those different positions are distributed. You can see on the right. And it turns out that 99% of the positions are between 16 and 19 moves away from the, the, the solution to the puzzle. That means if you take a solved cube and start just sort of manipulating it randomly, um, it's very likely that, that quickly the cube sort of slides down a probability gradient and reaches that region of the, of the space of possible configurations where it's between 16 and 19 moves away. And as you continue to ma manipulate it, for the most part, it's likely to stay there. Um, and so that's, that's giving sort of a sense of entropy as a statistical process, as the, it's a, it's the, the, the likelihood of a system sort of sliding down this probability gradient towards the most likely configuration. Um, from a biological point of view, the interesting thing is just how sort of inexorable that process is. Um, because that we think then in, in, in biological systems, we think about the possible configurations of the molecules and atoms that make up your body, the vanishing, vanishingly small number of them that correspond to, to you being a living organism. Um, and you've probably you've possibly heard this kind of discussion, this kind of argument before, and you probably anticipate that I'm going to say, okay, but just as you know, expert solvers of a Rubik's cube can apply appropriate algorithms to quickly, very quickly solve the cube, natural selection can act as an algorithmic process to sort of constrain these biological systems to these adaptive solutions. Um, and that's true, but it's not the whole story because we can't basically assume uh, an external solver for those kinds of systems. Uh, and if we move to a slightly more traditional model of thermodynamics, we can, we can see that problem a little bit more clearly. So if we imagine, for example, a room filled with uh, some uniform gas where the molecules are basically uniformly distributed across the room, uh, and we imagine a movable wall in the center, um, we see at the top left there that there's basically no net force on that wall because essentially the pressure is the, both, is the same on both sides. Um, if we then imagine a very far from equilibrium system, um, we see that you know, there, there's the tendency then of that system to, to move towards equilibrium, creates a directional force, uh, and that force creates the, the potential that we can harness it to do useful work. So something similar happens, for example, in the piston of a car where we create a very high level of disequilibrium by basically igniting fuel and releasing a lot of stored energy. Um, so again, you anticipate now my argument that I'm gonna say, okay, the second law is inescapable in closed systems and isolated systems. We can't never escape uh, entropy. We can never escape equilibrium, but living things are not closed systems. 
um, they're able to draw on energy from other systems like the sun that are far from equilibrium and they can use that energy then to drive these processes. Um, and again, that's true, but there's another question then that sort of, why is there all this free energy sort of laying around? Why nearly 14 billion years into the history of the universe should there be all these sort of far from equilibrium systems waiting out there to be exploited? Uh, and there's one more piece of the puzzle that we basically need to explain this story. Um, and that's that our universe starts off in, a, in an extraordinarily low entropy state. Um, so on this slide at the bottom right there, shows uh, an image of the cosmic microwave background radiation, basically provides a snapshot of conditions in the early universe. Um, and it's colorized to highlight sort of fine scale temperature differences. Um, but the striking thing about this data is, is how uniform the conditions it reveals are. So basically with this data set, you can essentially look back in time, nearly 14 billion years to a point in the early universe, and then look at the opposite direction to a point in the 14 billion light years in, the, in, the, in that direction. And those two points are so far apart that they can never have possibly interacted in the time scale on which our universe has existed. Uh, and yet the conditions there are amazingly sort of similar. And our basic, best understanding then basically is that this is the result of inflationary processes in the early universe. Inflation basically blows up some infin infinitesimal region of space to universal scale. The fluctuations that we do see are plausibly uh, the results of quantum mechanical sort of fluctuations in that initial space that again get blown up to an enormous scale uh, and then can serve as seeds for the later development of stars and galaxies and so forth. Um, and with that initial boundary condition, we can then move on to make an argument about, okay, with, with far from equilibrium systems available out there, um, they can potentially be exploited then to drive the emergence of complex systems and eventually of living systems. Uh, and to talk a little bit about living systems, or before even talking a little bit about living systems, I want to talk about another toy model. Um, I want to talk about John Conway's uh, toy universe called the Game of Life. So Conway's universe is a very simple sort of uh, model. Uh, it basically consists of a grid of cells uh, of, of indefinite extent that where each cell can either be on or it can be off. Uh, and in Conway's universe, there's a very simple set of physical, physical laws that govern the universe. Uh, and they're listed here. It basically says any on cell that has exactly two or three neighbors that are also on stays on. Any other on cell turns off. Any off cell with three neighbors exactly that, turn, that are on turns on. Uh, and the remarkable thing then is if you iterate these simple rules, you see very interesting things um, happen, uh, including the emergence of sort of higher level entities that have their own sort of behaviors. Um, so these small objects that you see coming up the arms here are called gliders in Conway's game. Uh, and then this is a gun that creates streams of gliders that then come together in the middle and sort of self-assemble these spaceships that you see going off to the right. Um, and this particular structure probably has been intelligently designed to at least some extent. Um, but if you play around with the game, it's trivially easy to get things like gliders and spaceships just sort of falling out. Uh, and this structure is not so complex that you can't imagine that if you randomly seed a large enough area of Conway's universe, you get even structures like this basically for free, that basically come uh, in a self-organizational way. Um, and using that as an analogy, I'm basically going to skip over all, most of physics and chemistry and argue that similar sorts of things in our own universe, similar sorts of processes, are sufficient to explain the existence of complex, far from equilibrium systems up to and including things like hurricanes. The hurricane is basically a heat engine, draws an energy from the sun, uh, and when the proper conditions arise over some tropical ocean, you get a hurricane. Um, that self-perpetuates as long as those conditions persist. The hurricane moves over colder water, it dissipates. If those same conditions arise again, you get another hurricane. Um, living things are different, right? And it requires another level of explanation. Uh, and it's always been the case, the, the most striking things about living things, the thing that has always given us the impression that they required some special explanation beyond what we need to explain in the rest of the living world uh, is the presence of sort of teleology of purposefulness of what I call here the design. Um, because hurricanes for all the complexity don't give you the sense of having goals. They don't give you the sense of being designed for anything. Uh, and the way a bird's wing clearly gives you the sense of being designed for flight. Uh, and I put designed here, designed for in scare quotes. Uh, a lot of biologists would avoid using designed in this context to avoid uh, any risk of confusion with sort of intelligent design. Um, I use the word advisedly, recognizing that there's a difference, but because I want to emphasize the continuity 
between the design of the bird's wing and the design of the airplane wing. Um, in fact, one of the points that I would like to come out of this talk uh, is that the Darwinian idea is capable not just of sort of answering the argument from design, but it turns the argument of design on its head. Um, what I would argue is that you know, prior to Darwin, it was basically impossible to alter an explanation for the bird's wing that didn't draw on or invoke uh, intelligent design. Um, but now 150 years or so on from Darwin, uh, it's basically, in, in especially from an informational point of view, uh, it's difficult to um, offer any explanation of in intelligent design processes that don't draw on ideas of, of Darwinian sort of principles. Um, and so having made that, that sort of bold claim, let's talk a little bit about what Darwin actually said. So I wanna focus specifically on Darwin's argument about natural selection and then boil it down to sort of its basic elements. And so Darwin basically started his argument for natural selection with this observation that there's a struggle for existence, that it's simply impossible for every organism to survive and reproduce at the maximal rate. And therefore, there will be differential reproduction, in which case some organisms within a population will leave more offspring than others. The sort of second part of the argument is that that differential reproduction is not purely random. It depends on variation in organism traits, particular traits or values of traits um, in, influence your, your likelihood to leave offspring. And, and the third part is what I call inheritability here. Uh, it's the, that there's correlation between traits of parents and offspring. There's a resemblance between traits and offspring. Um, so that the, the, the individuals in the population that wind up leaving more offspring because of these beneficial traits also pass those traits on disproportionately to offspring and those traits can proliferate from the population. Uh, and Darwin's basic argument was if those three factors hold, then you get this process of natural selection that will create adaptation, will create fitness, which in Darwin's day, I think he would have understood as sort of the fit of the organism to its environment. Um, so let me step back now and sort of schematically represent sort of this argument. So I've argued that, you know, by analogy to sort of Conway's process and the arguments made before about entropy, we can explain complex structures in the non-living world like hurricanes um, as basically structures that dissipate energy gradients in the environment, send other systems closer to thermodynamic equilibrium, extract useful energy from that and drive their own internal dynamics. Um, but then I've argued that if we want to explain living things like a cat, well, a cat's also a complex physical structure. Um, so all the same thermodynamic principles apply, um, but that we also now need this sort of informational axis that we bring in. So Darwin wouldn't have necessarily talked about his art, his mechanism in term, informational terms, um, but from a modern perspective, I think it very much is. So the way I would explain it is to say that we have a situation where we have the information that's encoded from the DNA that interacts with its environment through the process of development to give rise to the phenotype of the organism. And then at the population level, Darwin's mechanism of selection basically acts in a way at, at editing the gene pool so that the information that's getting passed on is, is creating these sort of adaptive phenotypes that are good at sort of, at a sort of um, well, at, at creating organisms that, that satisfy the thermodynamic constraints, but then also wind up passing on this information. Um, and then we arrive basically at an explanation for organismal adaptation uh, along those lines, where we can sort of see the genome as a set of instructions that basically says, here's how you build a, a thermodynamically efficient sort of organism that then copies these instructions. It's sort of a cosmic chain level, the chain letter that says copy these instructions by building an elephant or whatever species that we're talking about. Uh, and a key point here is that by the nature of this process, the, these set of instructions are always a little bit, there's a time lag. The, the genome encodes a set of instructions about traits that were adaptive in previous environments because they're being passed down from previous generations. And that's sufficient to explain organismal adaptation to the extent that the, or if the environment doesn't change dramatically from one generation to the next, um, and if there's not a lot of unpredictable variation across time and space within individual generations. Um, but neither of those things holds universally. And so if we want them to understand how uh, organisms are, are, are fitted to their environment or adapt to their environments on sort of a fine temporal scale, uh, we need to talk about how the processes by which uh, organisms construct information uh, in real time within individual lifetimes tend to augment the adaptation provided by natural selection. 
So I update my schematic there, add another error, error, arrow to uh, indicate the input of sensory information on the phenotype. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that. And the first example I want to talk about is one that we don't sort of always or, or even usually talk about as a sensory system, but basically is a sensory system. Uh, and that's the adaptive immune system in mammals and, and humans. Um, and the reason I like this example is because it emphasizes the extent to which this sort of sensory system is, is itself a selective process. Indeed, the adaptive immune, immune system is arguably a sort of a Darwinian sub-process built on the underlying process of natural selection. Uh, the imperative for, for building this process uh, is to keep up, in, presumably is it to keep up in an arms race with these microbial parasites and pathogens. Uh, and in order to do that, we generate a huge amount of sort of additional genetic variation um, by having the sort of process where we have sort of targeted recombination directed towards highly variable portions of the genome that allow us then to create this enormous library uh, of antibodies that are basically capable of recognizing almost anything they encounter. Um, and then because they're capable of recognizing almost anything they encounter, uh, this, this process of generating variation is followed by uh, a two-step process of selection. So in the early stages of development, we have negative selection where we're basically removing uh, cells that produce antibodies that recognize parts of the organism itself to avoid sort of autoimmune responses. Uh, and then later on, we have positive selection in which we're upregulating cells that produce antibodies that recognize, you know, uh, some novel pathogens that we encounter like COVID to provide immunity. Um, now, if we move on to talk about you know, what we more traditionally talk about as sensory systems, like olfaction. So in the next talk, uh, Consuelo will talk about quite a bit about work about plant volatiles and how they mediate interactions between plants and other organisms, including insects. Uh, so in the insect, insect olfactory system, again, it's not immediately clear that it's, that it's also the sort of selective process, not as clear, I think, as the immune system, but it has many of the same features. So the, in, the immune, in the insect um, olfactory system, for example, um, we again create a large sort of diversity of receptors that recognize sort of individual chemical compounds. We deploy that to, to the, the peripheral nervous system, to the antenna and other organs. But then behind that, we have this sort of hierarchical set of, uh, of neurological structures that are capable of integrating information that's coming from those receptors at sort of different levels of organization. Um, and the result is that the organism can not only sort of recognize the presence and absence of many different compounds, but it can, it can make sophisticated sort of integration of that information it Can recognize cues that involve, for example, relative ratios of some particular set of compounds that we attend to. Uh, and there are a number of, imp of implications of that, um, I think. Um, one is that different organisms can then construct, they can you know, not only attend certainly to different aspects of the blend, focus on some set of chemicals versus some other set of chemicals, um, but different organisms can construct entirely different information even about the same, the, the exact same aspects of the blend. Um, so for example, if you have, uh, we consider an herbivore that wants to find the plant to feed on the plant or a parasitoid that wants to find the plant to attack the herbivore or a mosquito that wants to avoid the plant while it's looking for a human or a, uh, an animal to get a blood meal, um, then they may be constructing entirely different sort of sets of information about the exact same cues. Uh, and to belabor, belaboring that point a little bit, but it's interesting because I think it, it goes to this idea that I prefer to talk about information as something that organisms are constructing about the environment rather than something that's out in the environment waiting to sort of be collected or discovered. Um, and it makes me skeptical. Sometimes I read these papers that talk about tracking information flows through ecosystems the way we track nitrogen or energy. Um, and maybe if we can, can constrain what we're talking about, we can do that sometimes. Um, but information is fundamentally different than energy or matter uh, in the way that we talked about before. And so it, it, it has this sort of subjective, private sort of aspect to it. Um, so I think that, 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 that that's uh, one part of it. Also, what I'd say is, you know, again, when we think about applying information theory, to systems like this, and it's very tempting to say, okay, the, the, the odor, the plume then is the communication channel, and we can make some assumptions and define configuration states, and we can start to measure the quantity of information and so forth. Um, and I think it's difficult, challenging to do that, exactly because even in our best model organisms, we generally don't understand how they're constructing information about, uh, about these systems in a very, uh, in a very 
uh, clear way. So I think that's a, that's a challenge in that. Um, the final thing I want to say about the sort of sensory information is um, that these is to point out that these sensory systems are themselves product, product, products of natural selection. Um, and in, in the process of constructing information about the environment, they also embody assumptions about the environment. Uh, and to illustrate that using visual uh, information, even the visual system as an example, uh, here's a picture of another sort of cube like object. And most of you will probably perceive the central cube on the top of this object as being brown and the central cube on the front as being orange. But if I play the movie and bring in a mask that covers other, vis other visual cues, uh, it turns out that those two cubes or those two tiles are exactly the same color, at least in terms of the frequency of light that's being reflected from them. Uh, and presumably what's going on here uh, is that, you know, with the light cues in place, it looks like the front of the cube is in shade. Uh, and so your, your mind, you're, you're at some level before it's presented to your consciousness, is, is, sort of, is sort of correcting the color for what it perceives to be the ambient light levels. And that's just to sort of hi to highlight that those sorts of assumptions are built into these systems. <clears throat> So with that, I've presented a model in which, okay, we have these thermodynamic constraints. And then with that in mind, we can have natural selection that can, can uh, build adaptive organisms. And then we can augment that adaptation that's produced by natural selection via these sensory systems and adapt organisms to the environment. So now we have a model of organismal adaptation. But we need to recognize then that sometimes in the process and over the course of evolution, the rules basically change entirely. Um, that there are these inflection points where there are emergent things emerge in in in, uh, in the course of evolution, uh, including in sort of entirely novel levels of organization. Uh, so famously, sort of Maynard Smith and Zach Murray talked about these inflection points as sort of major transitions in evolution. Uh, I've put their sort of original list here. We can argue about what belongs to the list and what doesn't. Um, but the point that I want to make is that that whatever's on the list, it's almost uh, in every case, if not in every case, uh, involves changes in the ways that information is stored, encoded, transmitted, uh, or the levels at which those things happen. So, for example, in this list, they talk about you know, the evolution of genetic code, uh, but then later they also talk about the emergence sort of, of human language. Um, there's also a special sort of subset of the transitions that involve uh, cases of the emergence of higher level organization where lower level individuals are basically subsumed within higher level individuals. So with genes, within chromosomes, within cells, within multicellular organisms, within to some extent sort of societies. Um, and that process, that sort of multi-level stuff, that sort of issues about conflict and cooperation within groups um, has been a major subject of study and debate and argument within evolutionary biology. Um, and we don't have time to go into that in any detail at all, really. Um, but what I want to sort of point out that in general, we can sort of view those sort of multi-level things as being about uh, the level at which selection acts, right? So we can, we can think about selection acting at a lower level among individuals within a social insect colony or individual cells in your body, um, and then the higher level uh, between colonies or between individuals. Um, and we don't go too far wrong to think almost that the lower level selection is like a centrifugal force that's trying to tear these parts, these groups apart. And the between group selection is a, a stabilizing force that sort of promotes cooperation and promotes group, group cohesion. Um, and then if we want to think about that, so if we want then the emergence of this higher level organization, we basically we need to suppress the lower level selection, right? So that selection can prevail at the higher level. And if we go back to Darwin's argument about natural selection, Darwin said, look, if you have variation in differential reproduction heritability, selection is going to occur, period. Um, so if we want to suppress selection, it stands to reason that we want to basically break one of the legs of the stool, one of those three things. Uh, and generally, often we, we do it by reducing the genetic variation at the lower level or opportunities for reproductive success. So in your own body, for example, uh, the fat cell, a fat cell, uh, is presumably happy in evolutionary terms to spend its whole sort of life as a storage organ for your body with no real prospects for its own sort of direct long-term reproduction, uh, both because it shares the same genes as the genes in your germ cells um, and because it has limited prospects for differential reproduction anyway because we've, we've, had, we've segregated the germline cells in early stage of development. Um, and the same thing we would explain, for example, the sort of extreme altruism that we see uh, in social insects, where, for example, in these honeypot ants, uh, 
some workers also spend their lives basically as storage organs for the whole colony. And we make the same sort of arguments. Um, and I sort of presented this in the multi-level context. Um, we argue, we can argue about multi-level selection groups, some sort of group selection or kin selection or neighbor modulated fitness and so forth. Um, but all of this sort of multi-level presentation that I've given is sort of rest on this sort of gene-centric sort of view that originally originates, I would argue, with Hamilton's work on inclusive fitness in the 1960s. Um, and the key insight there, and why it, I think it fits in this sort of discussion of information, is that it doesn't matter for the fat cell or for the, the honeypot ant worker, whether it's maximizes its own reproduction and passes down genes directly, or whether it contributes to the passing on of genes from some other individual, the queen or your own germline cells, uh, as long as the information in those genes is the same, right? And it, even again, Hamilton maybe didn't explicitly talk about it in that in those terms, but this is also an informational process. It depends on the observation that the genes are basically fungible, that the same genetic sequence over here is the same as over there, and that they can spread in that way, because it's not the physical gene that's passed on by the, the, the fat cell or the the ant worker, uh, but it's the same sequence. It's the same informational gene that's been passed. Um, and so with that, then I've presented a model in which we have adaptation and it's augmented by sensory information. Uh, and sometimes the rules that change entirely and the ways in which information is stored, transmitted and the levels of organization change. Uh, and we can now explain biological um, adaptation in animals. Uh, and then the final thing that we need to talk about here is that humans are different. Uh, and going back to my schematic, I make an argument that the reason humans are fundamentally different from other organisms uh, and that we can't explain human behavior entirely basis, uh, on the basis of this arguments about natural selection act, acting on genes and differential reproduction and so forth, uh, is that humans have cumulative culture. So in addition to information that we're, we're transmitting vertically via the genes uh, and augmented by information we acquire in the sensory sense, Humans acquire cultural information and then modify that information and pass it on to other individuals uh, in a way that doesn't feed back directly on, doesn't have to feed back directly on reproduction, doesn't have to feed back directly on genetic evolution, uh, and therefore can serve sort of as a, as a dual inheritance system, right? as, a, as a, an entirely sort of independent evolutionary system that's co-equal in, in a sense with the genes and maybe even in some cases uh, more powerful than genetic evolution. Um, to clarify what I mean then by culture, uh, and it's not, culture is not exclusive to humans. Um, it's, I'm talking about sort of non-genetic information can be behavioral strategies, can be other information that's passed on between individuals. Uh, it can be across generations or within generations, but by non-genetic means, but then can proliferate within populations. And so a good example would be the sort of potato washing behavior in Japanese and cats that you see at the top. So this is a behavior that was observed to originate, to be innovated by a single individual in a semi-natural sort of research population in Japan, uh, and then spread within that population. And the point is that it's a learned behavior. So you can move an individual who knows about this behavior from one population to another, and the, popula and the, the behavior begins to spread again. Uh, chimpanzees do similar things in the wild. Chimpanzees have a, a fairly varied toolkit. They do things like stripping branches and using the fish for termites. Uh, in some populations, they use sort of natural stone anvils and they get stones to crack nuts. Um, and that also would sort of count as cultural variation. It's not just in primates, we find things in cetaceans, we find things in similar things in birds. Um, but while I think this counts as culture, it doesn't take off as an open-ended sort of evolutionary process in any other organism besides humans. Uh, and I just want to point out, though, that even in humans, it doesn't take off right away. So for a long time after our divergence from chimpanzees, maybe even early on, we had more tools than the chimpanzees have. We had more sophisticated tools than chimpanzees had. But we're like huge chimpanzees in the sense that there's a very, fairly fixed toolkit uh, that varies a little bit from place to place, but isn't being innovated and changing dramatically very rapidly over time. Uh, to the point that you can sort of look at this limited toolkit and say, OK, this is, this is human technology, what human technology looks like over a period of hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and then later, maybe there's an era we recognize, okay, now they're making more sophisticated tools, they're making different tools. This is a new era of human technology. But again, we can point to it and say, this is human technology for a period of you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. Um, at some point, we migrate out of Africa, we inhabit all colonized sort of all 
different climates. Uh, we develop um, clothing and other adaptations that allow us to adapt to those climates. We harness fire uh, and yet still more sophisticated technology, but we still not have the sort of open-ended system. It doesn't, we don't have fast rates of innovation. We don't have massive sort of divergence over space. Uh, and then at some point we do have those things. Um, and it's, it's frequently cited at this time point of 50,000 years ago that cultural sort of uh, divergent cultural tra traditions become widespread. Uh, I don't want to emphasize the suddenness of this. I think it's probably still a gradual process. I think in, in local populations, this is probably happening considerably earlier possibly. Uh, and yet, nevertheless, certainly over the last half million years, which is still a very fast period in, in, in evolutionary terms, um, we go from this situation where humans are sort of have this very limited cultural set like what chimpanzees have to where we are basically have more of a cultural uh, system like modern humans, where you see now rapid rates of, in, of innovation and you see rapid divergence of cultural traditions from one place to another. Uh, and once that process it takes off, it, there's this sort of ever increasing sort of accelerating aspect to it. Um, so for example, we have, you know, we have widespread culture by 50,000 years ago, certainly. Uh, and then by 10,000 years ago, we have the origins of agriculture and sort of the modern, you know, recorded history. Uh, and then within 10,000 years, we have the invention of the airplane and heavier than air flight. Uh, and then within a, a single human lifetime, we have Neil Armstrong standing on the moon. Um, and I like this sort of example of flight because to me, it really sort of emphasizes the sort of, the sort of accelerating sort of aspect of human cultural and technological evolution. Um, but in the context of the talk, maybe I should have talked about, uh, you know, uh, again, continuing to talk about changes in the way that information is stored. So we could talk, for example, uh, about the origins of human language and then about the origins of written language uh, and then about the origins of the printing press uh, and journalism and mass media and radio and television uh, and computers and the internet and the iPhone and social media and so forth. Uh, and we can talk about all of those as examples, again, where changes in the ways in which we're storing uh, and transmitting information have major implications for human behavior and human social organization. Uh, that will have to be another talk, but I will finish um, just with this sort of epilogue that to emphasize a point that's sort of already implicit in what I've said before. Uh, I call it epistemology in the, inf in the liberation of information. Uh, and the point is that prior to this sort of emergence of this cumulative culture in, in humans, um, we think, and I think rightly, that if we go and look at non-culture bearing organisms like the elephant, um, and we can argue this, but where elephants have cultural aspects of their behavior, but in any case, non-human organisms, we think for the most part that we can explain all the adaptive aspects of their phenotypes and their behavior in terms of natural selection operating on genes. And yes, they can do cognitive functions and they can build sensory information, but it all has to feed back on this, you know, this sort of inexorable way on genetic reproduction because over, long, over the long term across generations, natural selection is the only process that's creating adaptation in this population. Um, then when humans come along, again, as I've, I've argued, we, we have cultural information. And so now we can acquire cultural information. We can reason about it. We can think about it. We can feel about it. Uh, we can modify it and pass it on in ways that again, never have to feed back on genetic evolution. Um, and that, you know, the liberation of information is in that sense that that changes the sort of knowledge that can be created in the world, the sort of ideas that it is possible to think. Um, and to be sure, cultural evolution occurs to a large part on a psychological and mental landscape that's been shaped by natural selection and will, will tend then to incline the sort of direction of cultural uh, evolution in particular directions. But nevertheless, it opens up a broad scope for the emergence of different uh, religious beliefs and political ideologies. And if we do it right, the possibility of creating selective processes that can actually tell, pr provide information or create information that provides an accurate model of the world as it actually is. Uh, and so I will close then with an argument that, that we should see science as one of these processes, as a Darwinian process um, that's capable then of creating accurate uh, information about the world. Uh, and I mean this about science not broadly construed, so not about science as an institution or a profession or something that's done by people with white lab coats, um, but something that's been done wherever people sort of basically develop a model of how they think the world works, um, but then rather than just sort of taking that as an article of faith, uh, 
they subject that to inquiry, testing it against evidence, testing it against the world out there. Um, I would point out then that the methods that we use to do that, including informal science, are inherently sort of selective. We're building models, we're testing those models, we're falsifying those models. Uh, and I would finish with this argument that that's, that that's not a process that depends on some assumption about objectivity. You, you sometimes see this critique of science that says, well, scientists, you think you have this monopoly on the truth, you think you have this, you have this, this monopoly on objectivity. Um, but science properly construed doesn't assume objectivity. Science is a tool for dealing with the fact that objectivity is basically impossible. Um, that, that we have to be aware that every observation is inherently subjective, every point of view uh, from a particular time and space. Uh, and the argument is that if we integrate enough observations and, and work, you know, again, rather than taking them individually as articles of faith, uh, to try and find models that can explain as many of them as possible, as with the parable of the blind and the elephant, we can continue that process and iterate that process, uh, and never, never reaching sort of certainty, always maintaining skepticism. But if we if we do it well and if we do it long enough, uh, we get a view ultimately of the, the whole elephant. And with that, I finish and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Mark. That was great talk, very interesting. Um, I just kind of had an observation, which is that um, I guess cumulative culture can be thought of as an open ended generative system, as you mentioned, and a second human language, um, like in the form of a sound, we can give rise to a huge number of intellectual beings and constructions. Do you think at some level those two things could be evolutionarily related uh, or rely on the same maybe complex? So, in you can, you can repeat the, the, the question for. for so the, the question is that I've, I've suggested that cu human culture is an open-ended sort of generative evolutionary process. And the, the observation is that language has many of those same features. And so that we also see that as an evolutionary process. Uh, and, and my answer would be definitely so. Um, but in my framework, I would want to call language, I think, a part of human culture for the most part. I mean, of course, it's human language is also specified to a certain extent by genes and natural selection, but but then the content of it and some aspects of it are culture. So maybe it's a it's a it's it's a maybe it's an it's a, to a certain extent a genetically evolved mechanism that for exactly for the purpose of cultural uh, cultural transmission. Yeah. Yes. So, so it's so dynamic. Yes. So the idea is um, what would be like the, the drive for the dynamic of utility. So the question is, and as I understand it, is the sort of a Bayesian uh, aspect of sense of constructing sensory information about the universe. You know, so you have you have these assumptions that are maybe set by the baseline of natural selection, and then you're constructing new information and updating your sort of understanding of what the conditions are. Um, and then the second question is, then what is the what is the what is the utility function that you're maximizing by doing? Is that, is that? Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. If you, for example, for, for uh, like the things like bees and yeah. uh, very security system for us, this utility evolves. Of course, it evolves. So the dynamic of the utility that we really depend on, like, the, if it has a correlation with the, you know, something that you have to get. Yeah. And we have this in dynamic. No, I understand. So then the question is okay, so so in the, in the non human example, in the example of the bees or the non sort of culture bearing organism. Uh, I would argue that that this is kind of the, the point I was making that the utility is always going to be in terms of Darwinian fitness and reproductive success because those systems are always built in a way that has to feed back information. Whatever we construct is only useful to the extent that it feeds back some favors reproduction that then can update the, the, the next generation of that system. Um, 
in humans, then the question is, once you have culture, and I, I made this argument that sort of information can now be about anything, right? We can construct information about anything. Um, there's still the imperative that it has to be transmissible, right? So that, that you never can get away from that when you're talking about information. Ideas that don't spread within populations don't spread, and those ideas will never exist. Um, but, but beyond that, I think, you know, then it depends on how we, we constrain and, and set up the, the, um, the selective system, right? So we can imagine, you know, we can imagine that there are, are religious ideas or whatever, or, you know, whatever sort of uh, uh, societal trends or fashion trends that sort of spread for whatever reason, you know, to a certain extent, drawing on the sort of intuitive aspects of human psychology or the evolved aspects of human psychology and spread in that way. Um, I'm arguing that if we, if we constrain it um, in the right way, we can produce scientific knowledge that sort of we set up the system to be in a way that produces accurate knowledge about the way the world is out there. Uh, and there's an interesting sort of interplay between those two because the, the, the religious belief and the fashion trend are likely to be extremely intuitive and easy to transmit. And the hard won scientific truths are likely to be very counterintuitive and difficult to talk about and require lots of sort of mathematical sophistication and so forth, right? And so there's that interplay. Um, and the other thing that I would say in response to your, to your question though is I think that there's also this argument that, or philosophical point or point of view that says, okay, we inevitably live at the sort of nexus of this sort of genetic informational system and this sort of cultural informational system. But somewhere there at that nexus, there's a possibility then for us to evolve our own sort of intents and purposes, right? That we can reason about, that we can choose, that we can say, this is what it seems to me that we should care about and what we should maximize and what, should, what should we should value as, as utility. And then we come, you know, then we come to actual utilitarianism and philosophy and sort of hedonic utilitarianism that says, you know, from a certain point of view, maybe we want to maximize welfare, which we, which we might define in terms of uh, of emotional well-being, right? We want have more happiness and more sort of well-being and health and less sort of suffering and those sorts of things. So that's part of it too, I would say, is that there, out of this comes the possibility for us to arise and become self-aware, think about these things, and then to a certain extent, make our own choices about what, what has utility and what we want to value and what we want to maximize. Yes? Um, would that create um, a kind of question on, well, being your thought on information itself, so well, it's matter, it's not, uh, it's not just um, uh, energy. But is it always linked to uh, living forms? So can, could you, could you um, define information outside of living forms? Because, uh, because well, uh, going uh, through your talk, we could say that on uh, living forms are at least conservation of information and then um, on well, the flight accumulation of information and refining and etc. So, could you could we talk about information on non-living forms? In non-living forms, for sure, in the sense that we a living organism can construct information about non-living forms, definitely. But the question is: Is there a concept of information that's prior to and, and independent of yeah. biology, right? Is it, is it, or, you know, in the framework that I'm presenting information, I, not really. In the framework that I'm presenting, information begins concurrently with life, right? Again, because of this point that information in, in the way I'm explaining it can really only ever be defined in the context of a particular reader that's interpreting it in a specific way. And we don't get readers that can interpret information in specific ways um, without, uh, until the origin of life and towards of evolution. Um, now, of course, physicists talk all the time about evolution of the information content of the entire universe and whether information is conserved on the surface of a black hole and so forth. And so I'm open to the idea that there's another conception of information that's, that's different, right, and we could talk about. Um, the other possibility is that that information the physicists talk about is implicitly about information as construed by a physicist, by an intelligent observer, right, is information that in principle we could construct uh, about the, you know, the, you know, the, the the total information content of the universe, right? In which case there's a connection between the two. But the way I'm defining it, it's, it's basically a biological concept. Yes. So you say that um, I'm talking about humans, that there is one specificity that the future information does not fit back on the whole collective behavior. Can we really, I mean, is this something very really clear for humans? I mean, there are certain populations in our future. And there's tons of interplay right and there will be gene culture co-evolution and so forth for me it's not 
for me, it's that it's not the imperative, right? The, the fact of culture allows the possibility that we can have things, right? And a lot of the work that people in this lab do, theoretical physics or whatever, my work, not, probably not maximizing reproductive success would be my argument about it. <laughs> so, so no, I, ab but absolutely, yes. In, in, in many, and, and, and also it can be, you know, you can have, culture can be uh, primarily vertical, right? And probably in earlier human populations was mostly vertical or much more so. And in some religious traditions will be more vertical than in others. Um, but it doesn't have to be. And when it's mostly vertical, then there will be sort of a coincidence of the interest of the cultural replicators and the interest of the genes. Uh, but when it becomes very horizontal, there will be conflict, right, between the two. So I would have two questions. Yes. The, the first one is that by doing that, actually, you are redefining information with different levels, right? You, you can see there is the, the, the information in the first level, which is what you perceive, what is the information that it comes to you. The second level would be the constructed information. It's the constructed information that the organism uh, uh, um, constructs based on, 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 on what it uh, is able to perceive. And then the last step you were uh, 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 saying, as again, we could say that the next step is the, is the transferable information, right? Information that you can share in a culture, for example. With the, with the, with the, are, are those levels of information, can, can we start to think of them more theoretically as, as we truly, we actually not uh, 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 um, different levels of information, but fundamentally completely different nature of information? I, I don't, maybe, I don't know. I mean, for me, it's sort of, are they different levels? For me, certainly there are totally different types of information, different codes, different sort of things, right? So from the, the sort of framework that I presented at the beginning, uh, we can think of information as occurring when there's a particular configuration of a system that has been, has been read by some other system and has a sort of informational sort of interaction. So this idea that we acquire information, right? So visual information that comes in and hits the retina. I kind of want to argue that it's not information when it's out there, right? If it's from a non-living system, if it's not a communicative system, it's just we observe, I observe the table or whatever, that it's not information until it, the configuration that matters then is the configuration of the, of, the, of the cells that respond on my retina, and that's information. And, but then it's translated into nerve signals, and that's a different code, and that's a different informational framework. And then it hits the brain, and then it's this sort of electrochemical stuff that I don't really understand, but that's a totally different sort of information processing thing. And then if I communicate it to you verbally, my model of it, then it's, you know, it's, it's sound waves in the air and so forth. And it's all, it's, so yeah, it's, but it's you can imagine it takes other, other ways, right? Almost mere, you know, in, almost infinite ways, right? And so then the question is, are those, can we classify those as different levels or we just say that it's, you know, that those are also always informational. And then it's also, I think this is the question is, is it the same information that's encoded in different ways or is it, you know, we're constructing information about information, about information, about information. But that basically means that, 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 that this is what we need to, to think about very carefully if you want to understand it. No? No. I, I mean, it's, 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 it's an intriguing aspect of it, for sure, that I think that probably deserves more, uh, more attention. I think. And my second question is, is uh, uh, why do you think, or do, uh, do you put any thought into the fact that although there has been a much, much, much longer time of evolution, in bacteria yep. and prokaryotes. Yep. Uh, um, so far, we have no evidence for prokaryotes being able to uh, uh, have made the evolution that we see uh, in, in eukaryotes. Not even uh, uh, the first step, which is to go to, to a, a multicellular. Well, some of the prokaryotes became eukaryotes, right? And then went that way. And maybe I think yeah, maybe that's, that's, a, that's that's again a place where information yeah. changes radically. Right? Yes. But you are a much better place to speculate on this than me, but but possibly maybe it, 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 that step of increased complexification that then allows division of labor and specialized organization and so forth, maybe is, requires that more sophisticated capability for, for information that then allows you to take the next steps. But I don't, you know, I'm not sure. There's always the question about why, why some groups have you know stayed in relatively simpler forms and others have not. And I, you know, like I said, you, you, I should ask you that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. If not, okay. Thank you very much.